So hello friends, I'm Dr. Vaibhav Seed. I'm your faculty of medicine at Global Academy of Medical Education. Uh, so welcome to FMG live medicine session. What we're going to do is we're going to cover the uh, PYQs that have been asked in your FMG papers. Uh, I'm going to cover the PYQs in the first part of the lecture and subsequently I will be covering some of the important topics that are for your, important for your exam like cystic fibrosis, uh, pulmonary embolism, bronchitis, and the subsequent part of the uh, lecture because they are important for your exam point of view and they need to be uh, covered. Okay, so without wasting further time, let's start with the PYQs. Okay, so the first question here is and the most repeated part of the question is giant V waves are seen in where? So as you know, if we record a JVP tracing, so what you're going to get is you're going to get a A wave, you're going to get a C wave, you're going to get a X descent, you're going to get a V wave and you're going to get a Y descent, right? So A wave basically corresponds with the atrial contraction. So A wave basically contract uh, corresponds with the atrial contraction and it comes before S1 and it comes before S1 and C comes due to the closure of the tricuspid valve which kind of uh, ejects blood or pushes blood back into the right atrium giving rise to sudden rise in the pressure. So as you all know JVP is basically telling you the pressure of the right atrium right it's telling you the pressure of the right atrium so no doubt about that right so then you have the x descent and you have the v wave so a wave and v wave along with the c wave these are the positive waves of the gvp and x descent and the y descent these are the negative waves in the jvp now the condition which is known as the tricuspid regurgitation in tricuspid regurgitation what you get is the the pressure the pressure of the blood that goes from the right ventricle into the right atrium the pressure increases so do you have too much of blood coming into the right atrium and the right atrium pressure kind of increases so what you're getting is a cv wave what you're getting is a cv wave as we say that the giant v waves the giant v waves are basically seen in tricuspid regurgitation tricuspid regurgitation what we call as the cv waves and what we say is that the waves have been ventricularized there has been ventricularized okay so the giant v waves are basically seen with tricuspid regurgitation so very common question that is being asked in your exam you should know other question that can be asked is absent a wave a very repeat question that is asked where do you see absent A wave? The absent A wave is basically seen with atrial fibrillation. Is basically seen with atrial fibrillation. Okay. So these are the two important questions that are asked from this area. You should know. These are repeat questions. You cannot afford to miss them in your exams. Okay. Next, another important question from your uh, basically the uh, JVP module. So they are asking you the rise in JBV with inspiration. They are asking you about rise in JVP with inspiration. So what is the normal physiology? So what is the normal physiology? Normal physiology is that the JVP should fall by at least 3 cm. It should fall by at least 3 cm with inspiration. So the normal physiology is that the JVP should fall by 3 cm with inspiration. Now what is the funda behind it? How you should remember it? What is actually happening is JVP you are going to see it here. Okay, you are going to see it here. So how do you remember that the JVP will fall with inspiration? So when you take a deep breath, that is the inspiration, what is actually happening is the JVP, the thorax, what I, uh, how I remember is and how I want you to remember guys is that when you're taking a deep breath, the column of blood that is up to here because of the pressure, because of the chest expansion, which is getting a lot of space. So the column of blood, which is up to here, it should fall. It should fall. That's how I remember. So that's why I say that the JVP falls with inspiration. That's a normal physiology. That's a normal physiology. Now, failure to fall or rise. If there is a failure to fall or there is rise in JVP with inspiration is pathological and it is known as small sign and it is called as a 
small sign. Now this small sign is basically seen in constrictive pericarditis. It is seen in constrictive pericarditis. Okay. So this is a very important information that you should uh, keep in your mind and is being regularly being asked. Now this question can be reframed that where do you get actually small sign? So where do you get small sign? So that can be another way of framing this question. Okay. Now there are other conditions also where you can get small sign and that is the right ventricular failure. That is the right ventricular failure, right ventricular AMI to be precise. I'm sorry for that. And other is the advanced LV failure. So other is the advanced LV failure. So constrictive pericarditis, right ventricular MI and advanced LV failure are the conditions where you can get the small sign. Okay. Now a very important, a very repeat question from the respiratory system. They keep on asking you, where do you exactly see exudative pleural effusion? So guys, uh, whenever we study about the pleural fluid, uh, whenever we study about the pleural effusion, we send the fluid for the pleural fluid analysis. We send the fluid for the pleural fluid analysis. The basic purpose of doing a pleural fluid analysis is to divide it into a exudate or a transudate. Is to divide it into exudate or a transudate, right? Now, the most common cause of transudative pleural effusion is heart failure. The most common cause of a transudative pleural effusion is heart failure. The other causes are say cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome and nephrotic syndrome. Okay. Now, when we talk about the exudative pleural effusion, exudative pleural effusion can have a myriad of causes. One of the causes could be infection, could be malignancy, could be a autoimmune disorder, right? Could be an autoimmune disorder. There could be a lot of causes of exudative pleural effusion. So what we actually do is whenever we draw a pleural fluid for analysis, we do a LIGHTS criteria. Whenever we get the blood samples report as well as the pleural fluid analysis report, we put in the LIGHTS criteria. Now what is actually the LIGHTS criteria? The LIGHTS criteria is whenever you have the pleural fluid protein upon the serum protein, if it is more than 0.5, if it is more than 0.5 a pleural fluid LDH upon the serum LDH, it is more than 0.6 is more than 0.6 or the pleural fluid LDH is more than the two third of upper limit of the serum LDH is more than the two third of the upper limit of serum LDH. So if any one of these criteria, if any one of the above criteria is fulfilled, if any one of the above criteria is fulfilled that basically leads to what is called as a exudative pleural effusion. So among these three causes, these are all causes of transudative pleural effusion. Remitted arthritis is cause of exudative pleural effusion, right? So the answer to this question would be rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So from here, what you have to remember is the lights criteria. What you have to remember here is the lights criteria. Okay. Next, another important question that you are being asked from the critical care. Critical care medicine. You, this question is being repeatedly asked. What are the components of Q SOFA score? What are the components of Q SOFA score? So Q SCOFA score has three components. One is the respiratory rate. Another is the systolic blood pressure. Third is the GCS. Third is the GCS. So if the score is two to three, there is a high chance that the patient is developing sepsis. It's a high chance that the patient is developing sepsis. So you should be very thorough with the Q SOFA score components, right? Q SOFA score component is being repeatedly asked in your exam and it's one of the important questions from your exam point of view okay next one of the favorite topics of your examiners is a cryptococcal meningitis cryptococcal meningitis so i'll discuss some of the points 
that are relevant to cryptococcal meningitis from your exam point of view. First and foremost, what you need to remember from cryptococcal meningitis and what question they will ask you, they will mention that the patient is a HIV positive patient, is a HIV positive patient with a decreased CD4 count, with a decreased CD4 count. If they are not mentioning that the patient is HIV positive with a decreased CD4 count, what they're going to mention is the patient is immunocompromised. The patient is immunocompromised. So immunocompromised patient presenting with a subacute headache. Presenting with a subacute headache. Fever may be present, may not be present. So fever plus minus you should be thinking in the line of a cryptococcal meningitis. So what you're going to get is increased CSF pressure. There will be increased CSF pressure and the CSF analysis would be very similar to the tubercular meningitis. So you're going to get a lymphocytic pleocytosis. Lymphocytic pleocytosis. You're going to get a decreased sugar with increased protein. And what is important here is you're going to get India ink that we do that going to show yeast cell that going to show yeast cell. So one of the important components of the microbiology examination of the CSF is going to show it to you that your patient is harboring a cryptococcal meningitis, right? Mm -hmm. Another thing that you can do is a CSF CRAG antigen uh, estimation. So you can go for the CSF cryptococcal antigen estimation, right? So this is very important and this is one of our prognostic markers also. This is one of the prognostic markers also. Now let me tell you guys, these patients have got a very bad headache. I've got a very bad headache. So when you do the CSF, this is not only a diagnostic, but it's also kind of a therapeutic. Is also kind of a therapeutic also. And how are we going to treat these patients? How are we going to treat these patients, right? So in these patients, we have a kind of an induction phase and we have a maintenance phase. We have an induction phase and we have a maintenance phase, right? For the induction phase, we have amphob. We mostly use the liposomal amphob. You can either give flu cytosine you can either give flu cytosine or you can give fluconazole or you can give fluconazole. But drug that we give in the maintenance phase is mostly the fluconazole. Is mostly the fluconazole, right? Now, what you have to also remember is you have to prevent the development of iris. That is the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So if you have a patient who is ART naive, so if you have a patient who is ART naive and is being diagnosed with cryptococcal meningitis, what you have to do is for the initial period, you have to start with the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis treatment. You treat for the cryptococcal meningitis followed by a certain time. Then you're going to start off with ART. Then you're going to start with ART. So you're going to not initially start with the ART. You're going to wait for the certain time period. Then you're going to start for it. Okay. Usually we can wait for somewhere close to two to six weeks. Two to six weeks that we can wait. Okay. So this is clear all about uh, cryptococcal meningitis. Right. So the keywords here are HIV positive, decreased CD4 count, immunocompromised, Remember the CRAG antigen part, remember the India ink preparation, right? And remember the treatment strategies that we use, induction phase, maintenance phase. So these are all important stuff that you have to remember about the cryptococcal meningitis. Next comes the question that you have a patient who presented to you with tingling and numbness following ingestion of multivitamins. So they are basically here talking about there has been an excess of a certain vitamin. There has been an excess of certain vitamin and that has basically led to a peripheral neuropathy. That has basically led to a peripheral neuropathy. 
Now guys, you have to remember one of a important vitamin that leads to peripheral neuropathy. There is a very important vitamin and that is the vitamin B6. The deficiency of which can also give rise to peripheral neuropathy and the excess of which is also can give rise to peripheral neuropathy. The excess of B6 basically leads to sensory ganglionopathy. It leads to sensory ganglionopathy and your patients can land up with sensory ataxia and your patients can land up with sensory ataxia. So the answer to your question here would be B6. Also remember if I just change the question I tell you which excess mineral which excess mineral congestion of which excess mineral can give rise to a peripheral neuropathy. So in your COVID-19 pandemic everybody had been pumping the zinc vitamins. So excess of zinc excess of zinc can also give rise to similar symptoms. So just keep this uh, important information in your mind while you prepare for your exam because this question the concept would be the same excess b6 causing sensory ganglionopathy and excess zinc also causing a peripheral neuropathy right okay so we move over to the yeah so we move over to the next question that is on the hepatitis right so they are asking about the fico oral spread so fico oral spread is basically seen in two types of hepatitis one is a and the other is E, other is E, right? Rest, all of them are mostly transmitted by other routes. They are not having no fecal oral route of transmission. No fecal oral route of transmission in these group of uh, virus, okay? So, hepatitis A would show fecal oral spread. Hepatitis A would show fecal oral spread. So, now this question comes from the nephrology. Anti basement and membrane antibodies are seen in which condition? So, guys, you can easily understand that we are talking about a good pasture syndrome here. We are talking about a good pasture syndrome here. So, you are, you are having the anti basement membrane antibodies and this basically give rise to hemoptysis you have hemoptysis so it is affecting your lung and it is affecting your kidney so hematuria lung and kidney involvement and ultimately the phenotype of this element is it give rise to rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis so it gives rise to rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis and when you do a kidney biopsy of these patients and you're doing a kidney biopsy of these patients you want to see crescents you want to see crescents okay so important information that needs to be kept in mind that all these things that anti basement embryo membrane antibodies are seen in basically good pasture syndrome they are seen in good pasture syndrome and whenever you do this immunofluorescence, you are going to get a linear immunofluorescence in these group of patients. Okay. So next important question is which is being repeatedly asked also. They want to know what is the uh, knowledge that you have regarding the staining pattern. So HIV positive patient with a CD4 count less than 100 and you have a pneumonia. So HIV patient presenting with pneumonia and a acid fast organism and an acid fast organism in the sputum, how are you going to differentiate? So where you can differentiate is by the CD4 count. So you can have two differentials here. One is the MAC mycobacterium avium intracellular and the other is nocardia. So the features that would help you towards nocardia is the CD4 count that is uh, CD4 count that is around more than 50 and you're going to have weekly AFB positive organism with branching filamentous structure with branching structure right. So nocardia would be weekly AFB positive and it's going to have a branching structure whereas MAC organisms they're going to see seen in cases where your CD4 count is 
less than 50. So this is also another important question that is repeatedly asked in your exam. They're going to ask you about CD4 count, patient ka low hai, HIV patient hai, pneumonia-like symptoms hai, and scrotum ka analysis when you have AFP positive organism. So what is it? Hemesis. Okay. Right. So another question is you have a female patient who is developing wheeze after taking aspirin for the headache. After taking aspirin for the headache. So here we are talking about basically the aspirin sensitive asthma. We are talking about the aspirin sensitive asthma. So the question asked is which is the false statement. So here the knowledge of your Samter's triad. The knowledge of Samter's triad is being asked in your question. They are asking you about the Samter's triad. So in the Samter's triad, what you get is aspirin intolerance. You get aspirin intolerance, you get bronchial asthma, and you get nasal polyps, and you get nasal polyps. And there is ex asthma exacerbated respiratory disease, okay? And what you need to remember is there are two types of asthma, which you need to know. One is the extrinsic form, and the other is the intrinsic form and the other is the intrinsic form in the extrinsic form what is the you need to know is that it is the atopic variant and there is increased ige levels there is increased ige levels another is the intrinsic variety which is non-atopic and it has got a normal ige level so basically the aspirin sensitive asthma basically has the extrinsic asthma it's an extrinsic asthma and there is increase in serum Ig and you can always understand that we are talking about here aspirin intolerance. From the question you can understand that they are being asking you about aspirin intolerance, right? So nasal polyp, part of the Samter's triad. Very important, important question asked too many times in the exam. So you cannot afford to miss such questions in your exam. Next would be the answer here would be the first statement here would be out of exclusion would be hypersensitivity to al allergens. So hypersensitivity to allergens would be the answer in this question. Okay. Next comes the question on tuberculosis. What is cryptic TB? So cryptic TB basically is a type of a miliary TB. So it is a type of a atypical miliary tb it's a type of a atypical miliary tb on this atypical miliary tb what is actually happening is why it is called atypical you're gonna have not gonna have features of the features of miliary tb that we get the miliary modeling the features of miliary tb that we get is the miliary modeling in the x-ray miliary modeling in the x-ray right you see one to two millimeter millet size opacities in your x-ray that's gonna be missing that's gonna be missing apart from that the tuberculin test the tuberculin test would be negative the tuberculin test would be negative okay so that's why it is known as a atypical miliary tb or the other name is a cryptic TB. Now, what is actually the problem with cryptic TB? It is kind of seen in elderly. It is seen in elderly, right? And because of its atypical manifestations, and because of its atypical manifestations, right, the diagnosis becomes difficult. The diagnosis becomes difficult and often it is being missed and often it is missed right so there would be unexplained fever there would be unexplained fever in a patient there would be weight loss but since you're having a normal cxr and a normal tuberculin test and a normal tuberculin test you're going to miss this diagnosis. You're going to miss this diagnosis. That's why this question is very important from the exam point of view. And you have to remember that cryptic TB, there would be a normal X-ray and there would be a normal skin tuberculin test, right? So this was about cryptic TB. I have added some information about miliary TB also in this question. Okay. Now, the, the questions on EDH 
and subdural hematoma is being repeatedly asked. So this, what you can see is a biconvex structure. So this is a biconvex structure, arterial bleed, right? If it's an arterial bleed, biconvex structure, right? This is a case of EDH. So this is a case of EDH. On the other hand, if you have a concave convex structure, if you have a concave convex structure, right? If you have a concave convex structure, which is due to the rupture of the bridging veins, which is due to the rupture of bridging veins, this it gives rise to what is known as the subdural hemorrhage. This basically gives rise to what is known as the subdural hemorrhage. So subdural hemorrhage, EDH, these are often repeat questions for your exam and you cannot afford to miss them. So I gave you an image of EDH here and I've explained you how does a SDH looks like in image in a CT scan, right? So we have covered this. Now, another question from liver part. So they are asking you which of the following is a cause of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So whenever you are getting a elevated bilirubin, whenever you are getting a elevated bilirubin, right, with a normal LFT, that is normal LFT is the point that you need to emphasize. That is basically the characterization of hyper bilirubinemias okay that is basically the characterization of hereditary hyper bilirubinemias now these can be divided into predominantly conjugated now this could be conjugated this can be unconjugated now we call it we call it conjugated when your direct fraction is more than 15% right when your direct fraction is more than 15 percent what do i mean by that whenever you are doing a bilirubin estimation whenever you are doing a bilirubin estimation we look for the total bilirubin we look for the direct fraction and we look for the indirect fraction now these are the two things that you can measure you cannot measure the indirect fraction so it has to be subtracted so if the direct fraction is more than 15 percent we call that as a conjugated hyperbilinemia and conjugated hyperbilinemia of two types, Dubin-Johnson syndrome and Rotor syndrome. Whereas the unconjugated means your direct fraction is less than 15%. And it is divided into two causes. One of them is the krigler nazar syndrome. So you have the krigler nazar syndrome and you have the Gilbert syndrome. Now, Gilbert syndrome is a very important cause of uh, unconjugated hyperbilinemia that we <coughs> often miss. That we often miss. Why? Because these patients often are asymptomatic. These patients are asymptomatic. They have a normal LFT. They have a normal LFT. The total bilirubin, the total bilirubin rarely crosses more than 5 to 6. It rarely crosses more than 5, 6. And the ictrus, ictrus is basically precipitated by stressful conditions, by stressful conditions and fasting. So they mostly remain undiagnosed for most of the time. They mostly remain undiagnosed for most of the time, right? Now, in this question, so you can easily understand, we are asking about unconjugated hyperbilinemia. That is mostly seen in the Gilbert syndrome. That is mostly seen in the Gilbert syndrome. Okay. Now, next question is, uh, you have a 14-year-old male with a family history of psychiatric disease and the, there's a finding on slit lamp. So, what you can see on the slit lamp, sorry, what you can see on the slit lamp is presence of KF ring. This presence of a KF ring. So guys, KF ring is highly pathognomonic of Wilson's disease. So it is pathognomonic of Wilson disease. 
along with that you need to remember that if it is present 99% of patients of neurologic wilsons so neurologic wilsons disease 99% would have ki frame whereas 70 to 80% this number varies from books to books 70 to 80% with liver manifestations would have ki frame would have ki frame right plus along with that if you are having a family history along with that if you are having a family history of a psychiatric disease of a psychiatric disease or a neurological disease or a neurological disease especially in a patient who is young than 40 years of age who is younger than 40 years of age you should always think about wilson's disease right so wilson's disease is basically a disease of a copper metabolism it's basically a disease of copper metabolism the inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive so what is happening here is you have decreased ceruloplasmin you have decreased ceruloplasmin levels and you have increased urinary copper excretion and you have increased urinary copper excretion and if you do the liver biopsy and if you do the liver biopsy in these patients which is basically the gold standard of the diagnosis that would show you increased hepatic copper that would show you increased hepatic copper right so this is how you diagnose wilson's disease and the treatment would be by the chelating agents the treatment would be by the chelating agents so if you are using the chelating agents what chelating agents you are using you give deep penicillamine you give deep penicillamine okay this is what you can use a very important another chelating agent that you we you always use for the maintenance therapy is zinc is zinc now zinc is basically used in two ps for pregnant patients you have to use zinc for pediatric population also you have to use zinc and i have already mentioned that if you give excess of zinc too much of zinc would ultimately deplete the copper that can give rise to hypocupric myelopathy that can give rise to hypocupric myelopathy right so this is all about wilson's disease that you are supposed to know what is the cataract that it is causing sunflower cataract right and apart from that there are other manifestations also of uh, wilson's disease liver is being involved so you have all sorts of manifestation it can range from asymptomatic to end stage liver disease that is the cirrhosis that it can happen it can give rise to fanconi it can give rise to fanconi it can give rise to hemolytic anemia it can give rise to osteoporosis so these are also the manifestations of wilson's that are these are some of the other systemic manifestations that you need to uh, keep in mind right okay so now we have a very important question that is repeatedly asked from the nephrology and the glomerulonephritis segment so in your glomerulonephritis segment you have to remember that either you encounter a patient of nephritic syndrome or you encounter a patient of nephrotic syndrome okay so these are basically the two phenotypes that we mostly encounter and the most the common cause of nephrotic syndrome most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children is basically the minimal change disease is basically the minimal change disease right in minimal change disease why it's called as a minimal change disease naam mein hi answer hai it is called as a minimal change disease why because you don't get to see anything on light microscopy you don't get to see anything on light microscopy this term that is being used effacement of podocytes the term that is being used effacement of podocytes so when you do basically the electron microscopy 
when you do the electron microscopy what you see is the effacement of the podocytes what you see is the effacement of the podocytes okay if you do the immunofluorescence if you do the immunofluorescence what are you going to see you're going to see nothing it would be normal okay it would be normal okay other question that you can uh, get from this section is where do you see tram track appearance where do you see tram track appearance or where do you see the duplication of basement membrane where do you see duplication of basement membrane this is basically seen mpgn especially the type 2 variant it is basically seen in the mpgn type 2 variant okay so these are the important questions that you can get from uh, the glomerulonephritis section okay right so next question is you have a 28 year old chap who is coming with ptosis and he's showing a diurnal fluctuation and there is improvement with neostigmine what is the diagnosis so the question there you are asking is they are giving you that the patient is having ptosis the patient is having ptosis and there is diurnal fluctuation so there is diurnal fluctuation so if such a thing is being given in your exam be it ptosis or be it a muscle weakness with a diurnal fluctuation what is important here is these are pointing towards the neuromuscular junction disorders they are pointing towards the neuromuscular junction disorders the neuromuscular junction disorders we have myasthenia gravis we have lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome we have the lems we have the botulism we have the botulism. So these are the three important uh, disorders of NM, uh, neuromuscular transmission that we know of, right? Of which what you need to know is LEMS classically presents in the elderly group of population and there would be an underlying malignancy. There would be underlying malignancy. Mostly the CLA. Mostly this group of patients have got CA lung. Okay. So if you are getting a question on limbs, if you are getting a question on limbs, be rest assured that it will be either clubbed with an image based question on x-ray asking you about a malignancy, presence of malignancy there or they can just say that there is an associated carcinoma lung there. Okay. But in this question, they are showing sure telling you that there has been improvement with neostigmine. Normally in our textbook, we read about the edrophonium test. We read about the edrophonium test, right, which is done at the bedside to diagnose whether your patient is having a neuromuscular transmission disorder, neuromuscular junction disorder. So if there is an improvement with neostigmine in any patient who is showing diurnal fluctuation, this is highly uh, going for a NMJ disorder. And in an NMJ disorder in this age, where they have not mentioned about myasthenia gravis or anything else, so you have to think of myasthenia gravis. You have to think of myasthenia gravis, right? Next comes so, another important question that is being repeatedly asked. And the important topic here is gout. So gout and crystal arthropathies, they are very important for your exam point of view they are very important for your exam point of view okay so here we are asking a 70 year old elderly chap who has got a knee pain and analysis is showing a birefringent crystals right now let me tell you 70 year old patient with knee pain with knee pain and if they show you that they the crystals are positive birefringent if the crystals are positive birefringent, then the answer is calcium pyrophosphate disease. In calcium pyrophosphate disease, this is the disease that we see in elderly. This is the disease that we see in elderly and it has the most common site is usually knee. The most common site is knee and unlike gout, unlike gout, it does not involve 
and unlike gout it does not involve your grade 2 it does not involve grade 2 we all know that in gout we have something known as podagra in gout the most common site is first mtp joint right the first mtp joint is the most common site in gout but this is not involved in calcium pyrophosphate disease in calcium pyrophosphate disease what we get is a positive birefringent crystals right whereas uric acid crystals are negative birefringent they are negative birefringent okay so this question is very important from exam point of view so i have uh, told you also the additional information that comes with this question so answer here is the c double p d disease okay next question you have a 60 year old male with a unilateral throbbing headache and there is tenderness in the scalp right so what you have to remember is what are the causes of secondary headache what are the causes of secondary headache and you should also know what are the red flag signs if you don't know the red flag signs of headache how are you going to classify whether the headache is a primary headache or a secondary headache right so if you have read my modules i have repeatedly told you that the secondary headaches are always dangerous okay so what is the red flag signs that we are reading in this question so you have a 60 year old male number one is you have a 60 year old male okay second is you are having tenderness in the scalp so if you are having a tenderness in the scalp that means we are talking about the tender temporal arteries we are talking about the tender temporal arteries so this is going in favor of giant cell arthritis this is going in favor of a giant cell arthritis or also known as the temporal arthritis also known as the temporal arthritis now what you need to know about this is in these group of uh, patients it is basically a large vessel vasculitis this is basically a large vessel vasculitis the patients here have fever they have very bad headache they have tenderness in the region of temporal artery okay they have elevated esr this is very much characteristic that you get elevated esr in patients of gc it's not very specific okay it's not very specific even uh, you can encounter patients of giant cell arthritis with normal ESR also. But if it is there, then it is suggestive, right? It is suggestive that you have a giant cell arthritis there. The gold standard is, if you have to diagnose by a gold standard method, then you have to do a temporal artery biopsy. You have to do a temporal artery biopsy now what you need to remember is the involvement is patchy the involvement is patchy so if the involvement is patchy then you may miss the lesion you may miss the lesion and if you take the biopsy from the side which is non infect non affected so you may miss the lesion so what you need to do is take a long length biopsy long segment of artery or you can go for the multiple punch sites or you can go for the multiple sites of biopsy now what can happen in this temporal arthritis is the patient can ultimately develop blindness if you don't treat the patient can ultimately treat go to develop blindness they can ultimately develop blindness due to the development of aion due to the development of aion okay so the treatment that you need to do is you have to start the patient on steroids immediately you have to start the patient on steroids immediately you don't wait for the biopsy result to come 
you don't wait for the biopsy results to come you start the patient on treatment immediately you put the patient on steroids otherwise it's going to be detrimental another drug that we can use is recently that has come up is a il6 antagonist that is the tocilizumab that is the tocilizumab so you can use tocilizumab that is a, also a fda approved drug for giant cell arthritis that is a fda approved drug for giant cell arthritis okay next question is you have defective zine in duchenne muscular dystrophy so as you know that the defective gene in this group of patient is basically dystrophin is basically dystrophin and these are x linked disorders these are x linked disorders you have two different varieties of dystrophies one is the duchenne muscular dystrophy another is the bmd now dmd has got a basically early presentation early presentation and mostly by 12 years of age these patients are wheelchair bound they are mostly wheelchair bound now this thing you are going to not see in peckers you are not see in peckers apart from that you are going to see cardiomyopathy you are going to get cardiomyopathy and you are going to get respiratory involvement and you are going to get respiratory involvement okay so these things you're going to uh, get in patient of dusin muscular dystrophy what you can also get is cowers sign just remember this you get cowers sign in dmd along with that you get calf hypertrophy along with that you get calf hypertrophy in these group of patients okay next we're going to talk about what is the treatment of choice for acromegaly if they are telling you that surgery is mentioned in your question then surgery is the treatment of choice so because acromegaly basically arises from a pituitary tumor arises from the pituitary tumors so the treatment of choice in this case would be surgery what are the drugs that we have the drugs that we have is octreotide we have landreotide which is basically a longer acting preparation and we have a growth hormone receptor antagonist which is the pegvisomat which is the pegvisomat so you have to remember the drugs that we have octreotide landreotide and pegvisomat so these are octreotide of which is a short acting preparation landreotide is a longer acting preparation okay so the treatment of choice for acromegaly is basically surgery so you have to remove the tumor and get the patient treated okay again so again we are back with a question on the nephritic and the nephrotic syndrome component so a child with hematuria and rbc cast with protein if rbc cast is mentioned in your question then this is a case of nephritic syndrome this is a case of nephritic syndrome so if you're talking about the rbc cast if you're talking about the rbc cast or if you're talking about the dysmorphic rbcs if you're talking about the dysmorphic rbcs that means you're talking about glomerulonephritis you're talking about the glomerulonephritis and basically we're talking about the nephritic syndrome we are talking about the nephritic syndrome because in the nephrotic syndrome you do not get rbc cast you do not get rbc cast so in this question the answer would be post streptococcal glomerulonephritis because this is the example of a nephritic syndrome this is the example of nephritic syndrome okay rest minimal change disease mpg and nephrotic syndrome itself they are basically the classification of and subtypes of nephrotic syndrome so the question here is being asked on nephritic syndrome so the key word here to this question is presence of rbc cast okay next question you have a 40 year old male with gout so you have a 40 year old male with 
gout and the question is is what will you not use to lower the uric acid level what will you not use to lower the uric acid level so what you need have to remember from gout is there are drugs for acute attack and there are drugs for reducing the uric acid level or preventing the further attack now these drugs which are used for prevention these drugs which are used for prevention should not be used for a acute attack because it will precipitate another attack of gout so for the drug that we have for acute attack is mostly NSAIDs we have colchicin we can use glucocorticoids we have anakindra also we have anakindra also but for the prevention and for lowering the uric acid level we have allopurinol we have allopurinol we have febuxostat we have febuxostat we have probenecid we have benzbromine okay we have benzbromine and we have raspuricase we have raspuricase now these are the drugs that should not be used during acute attack of gout because if they are used in acute attack of gout it will precipitate another attack of gout it's going to precipitate another acute of gout so it should not be used for acute attack of gout so you can use allopurinol you can use febix so you can use probenicin but you cannot use colchicin because this is being used for the acute attack so the question on gout can be on uh, both these pages, right? So they can ask you about the drugs that you can use for acute attack. They can ask you about the drugs that you can use for the preventive. And they can ask you about which drugs you cannot use in acute attack. So these are the three questions, type of questions that you can get from the gout type, gout questions, okay? Next, we have GB syndrome. Now, GB syndrome is a very important topic that you get in your uh, exams, right? It's being repeatedly asked. You have to remember a lot of stuff about GB syndrome, which I'm going to tell you, right? So, GB syndrome basically presents as a ascending areflexic paralysis. So, it's a ascending areflexic paralysis. What is uh, it? Is a basically type of a polyradiculo. It's a type of a polyradiculo neuropathy. It's a type of a polyradiculo neuropathy. Normally, you have it is preceded by a diarrhea like illness. It's a preceded by a diarrhea like illness. The most common organism that we read about is Campylobacter. Most common organism that is implicated is Campylobacter jejuni. Is Campylobacter jejuni. But apart from Campylobacter jejuni, you can have a lot of the organisms that is being implicated. Say HIV, Epstein Barr virus, right? Epstein Barr virus, Zika virus, Nipah virus, SARS CoV 2. Everything has been implicated. Vaccines have also been implicated to cause uh, GP syndrome. And one of the vaccines that have been implicated is an influenza vaccine. So it presents as an ascending a reflexic paralysis. So what is important is the patients would quickly develop quadriparesis. Would quickly develop quadriparesis. There will be weakness, which would be proximal more than distal. There will be proximal more than distal. And it would be a symmetric weakness. It would be a symmetric weakness and there will be absence of sensory signs and symptoms. It will be absence of sensory signs and symptoms. Although you can have a bit of paresthesia, you can have a bit of paresthesia and the GPS can be involved. GPS can be involved, right? Joint position sense can be affected and it can be involved. You can easily uh, initially have transient bladder disturbances. You can initially have 
transient bladder disturbance but if there is involvement of the bladder but if there is a prominent involvement of the bladder do not think of gv syndrome if there is a prominent involvement of the bladder do not think of gv syndrome then you think of a spinal cord lesion think of a spinal cord lesion also if you are getting a sensory level also if you are getting a sensory level that means you have to think of a spinal cord lesion you have to think of a spinal cord lesion right now if you do a csf analysis in this group of patients csf analysis in this group of patients give rise to albuminocytologic dissociation albuminocytologic dissociation what is that so you're going to get cells that would be decreased or normal not decreased rather that would be normal so you're going to cells less than 5 and you're going to get increased protein mostly more than 100 mg per dl more than 100 mg per dl that is known as albuminocytologic dissociation if you are getting cells that are more than 50 up to 50 you can get in gb syndrome but if you are getting cells more than 50 think of hiv think of leukemia infiltration think of hiv think of leukemia infiltration right how we treat this group of patients treatment is by ivig or you can go for plasma pheresis or you can go for plasma pheresis right so this is about the gb syndrome okay now we have bell's palsy what happens is bell's palsy bell's palsy is basically the idiopathic lmn facial palsy so you have the idiopathic lmn facial palsy what is happening here is the entire face on the affected side is affected so you have the entire face on the affected side is involved right so what you're going to get is bell's phenomenon the upper part of the face is involved upper part of the face is involved upper part of the face is involved so you get bell's phenomenon along with that right now if you have certain vesicles on your ear if you have vesicles on your ear right if you have a vesicular rash on your external ear then you have to think of what is known as the ramsey hunt syndrome ramsey hunt syndrome okay so when you have element facial palsy what happens is this the upper face and the lower part of the face both are affected and when you have the human facial palsy when you have the human facial palsy what you get is the contralateral lower part of the face is affected and the upper part is spared the upper part is spared okay the upper part is spared in case of contralateral in case of a human facial paralysis okay now you have a 30 year old female with a small joint pain and morning stiffness so if you have a pay patient who has having a small joint pain small joint involvement morning stiffness is there right so all these things are pointing towards the rheumatologic diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis rheumatoid arthritis right so you have to read about rheumatoid arthritis you should be familiar with different type of deformities that you get in uh, rheumatoid arthritis swan neck foot nares leg line deformity the piano key movement okay all these things you should be aware of you should be aware of the cervical cord involvement in uh, ra should be aware of the kaplan syndrome you should be aware of the cardiovascular manifestations in ra right and you should also be uh, reading about dd merz therapy of ra so these are the important things that you should be reading from ra right i'm not covering in this lecture 
So next comes like you have a patient who is suspected to have meningitis, who is suspected to have meningitis, and the CHF is showing low sugar and increased protein. So CSF is showing low sugar and increased protein. Like in these case scenarios, what you can think of, you can think of a TBM, you can think of a bacterial meningitis, and you can think of a fungal meningitis, that is a cryptococcal. But what is now adding to your input? You have a upper low fibrosis with hyalur lymphadenopathy. So if you have a upper low fibrosis, if you have a upper low fibrosis with hyalur lymphadenopathy, so this is basically pointing towards the underlying tuberculosis. This is basically pointing towards the underlying tuberculosis. So if that is there in your uh, question that you are either getting a image based question showing that there is an upper low fibrosis, there is a hyalur lymphadenopathy, right? There's a hyalur lymphadenopathy or they show you that uh, in the question they're giving you a patient is having a fever, patient is having a weight loss, patient is having hemoptysis, right? These are the systemic manifestations that they are writing in the question. Then you should be thinking in the line of TBM. Then you should be thinking in line of TBM, right? Now TBM and fungal, they both are cause of a subacute meningitis. They are both presentation is mostly like a subacute meningitis. You will have headache for more than 10 to 15 days. There will be on and off fever. There would be on and off fever for more than that. And for fungal, you should be actually getting a hint in the form of there is some degree of immunosuppression. There should be some degree of immunosuppression that is being mentioned in the question. Okay. Now, another question that is being asked here is you have a 50 year old patient presenting with headache and neck stiffness with altered sensorium, right? <clears throat> so whenever you have a question on neck stiffness plus headache, right? Look into two things. Either you are having absence of fever or you are having presence of fever. Okay, so if you are having absence of fever, this is pathognomonic of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which presents like the worst headache of life. So which presents like the worst headache of life. Okay, whereas if you have fever, then you have to think in the line of meningitis or meningoencephalitis or meningoencephalitis, okay? So these two things, just keep in mind. Someone is having neck stiffness with headache and there is absence of fever. So if there is an absence of fever, you are thinking in line of subarachnoid hemorrhage. CVA to hoga nahi isme. You can get confused between these three. Encephalitis will not have meningeal irritation. So you can again get confused between two things. So the only differentiating point between these two is presence of fever and absence of fever okay so that's how you can differentiate so next question is which of the following is least contributive towards development of mucormycosis abhi in your exams you're going to get questions on mucormycosis this is an important topic why because covid-19 abhi gaya hai covid-19 mein bahut logo ko mucormycosis hua tha so mucormycosis ka questions kind of you can expect it for the next 2 3 years okay so what actually is contributing towards the mucormycosis? What are the risk factors? Okay. Mucormycosis unme develop karta hai jinko neutropenia ho. Jinko neutropenia ho. Ya they are having defective function of the neutrophil. Ya they are having defective function of neutrophils. Okay. Unme develop karta. Apart from that, you have important causes like if you are using steroids. 
the patients who are on steroid therapy they are at risk of developing mucormycosis and if you have uncontrolled diabetes mellitus uncontrolled diabetes mellitus is very much a risk factor for developing mucormycosis and recently we had covid-19 recently we had covid-19 so these three are very important causes of risk factors that give rise to mucor mycosis mucor mycosis and the most common variant the most common clinical subtype actually not variant i should say the most common clinical subtype of mucor mycosis of mucor mycosis that we encounter is the rhino cerebral orbital variant right so it is the rhino cerebral orbital variant right so you have the involvement of the sinus you have the involvement of the sinus from sinus it goes to the orbit untreated it goes to the brain right so this is kind of sequence so this is the about uh, mucor mycosis let's see what has been asked in the question so we have mentioned uncontrolled diabetes we mentioned neutropenia we have mentioned about the immunosuppression so chronic use of antibiotics jo hai wo nahi uh, risk factor hai so this will be the answer chronic use of antibiotics would be the answer here okay next comes the bitemporal hemianopia is seen with lesion of okay so you are having bitemporal hemianopia so this is basically seen with the lesions of optic chiasma so optic chiasma would give rise to bitemporal hemianopia right this is basically a heteronymous hemianopia now you can also be asked about homonymous hemianopia <coughs> so if you are having a homonymous hemianopia right if you are having a homonymous hemianopia so this is basically seen with the post chiasmal lesions this is basically seen with post chiasmal lesions so in your option you can have either occipital cortex you can have occipital cortex right so yahan pe occipital cortex means this is the lesion so you can have homonymous hemianopia right so this is basically bitemporal hemianopia or heteronymous hemianopia and occipital cortex involvement can give rise to homonymous hemi anopia right so this uh, pathway is very important anatomy ophthal medicine ka connection right right next important question is most common cause of death in dk right so if you know what is actually dk if dk is basically you have blood sugar levels which is more than 250 blood sugar levels more than 250 and it is most commonly seen in type 1 diabetes mellitus most common cause kya hai you forget the dose of insulin insulin is missed so you forget the dose of insulin or infections or stress are there then it is there is a precipitation of dka mostly seen in type 1 diabetes what do you see you see ph is less than 7.2 presence of urine ketones and there is acidosis or decrease by carbonate is acidosis or decreased bicarbonate right so the mortality in dk is very less the mortality rate in dk is very less and it is less than 5% and it is less than 5% but what is the cause of death and the cause of death in dk is the development of cerebral edema it is the development of cerebral edema that contributes towards the cause of that that contributes towards the cause of that and this development of cerebral edema is very common in pediatric population is very common in children i should say okay so you have to treat dk properly you have to prevent the development of cerebral edema 
So now you have uh, another question. You have a patient with tingling and numbness in extremity and you do the imaging. It is showing that there is a subacute combined degeneration of the cord. There is a subacute combined degeneration of the cord. So what actually is uh, happening in subacute combined degeneration of the cord? It's a very direct question that it is due to the B12 deficiency. It is due to the b12 deficiency <clears throat> so in b12 what hap it is happening that you are having a posterior column involvement you are having the posterior column involvement is there right and there is b12 deficiency in posterior column involvement if you look into the mri you're gonna get a v sign you're gonna get a v sign that is due to the posterior column involvement and what else you will get you're gonna get other features like optic atrophy. You're gonna get optic atrophy. So there is peripheral neuropathy. There is peripheral neuropathy plus there is involvement of the corticospinal tract. So in these patients, what you usually get is absent ankle reflex. Absent ankle reflex with extensor plantar. With extensor plantar. Okay. So this is the feature that you get in subacute combined degeneration of the cord. So the deficiency is the cause is vitamin B12. The cause is B12. And apart from the neurologic manifestations, you can have psychiatric manifestations also. You can have psychiatric manifestations also. These patients can also have an underlying psychosis. These patients can also have an underlying psychosis. Okay. And you will get decreased B12 levels. You're going to get decreased B12 levels in these group of patients. The treatment involves replenishment of the B12. The treatment involves you replenish the B12 levels. You have to replenish the B12 levels. Mostly we gave the IM injections of vitamin B12. Next question is what is Geisbock syndrome? So Geisbock syndrome is basically a spurious erythrocytosis. It is basically this spurious erythrocytosis. If you look into the table that I have taken from the Harrison, erythrocytosis can be categorized into two types. One is the relative, another is the absolute. In absolute, you basically you are having an increase in the RBC mass. Whereas in relative erythrocytosis, what is happening? There is hemoconcentration. So hemoconcentration can be secondary to dehydration, can be due to diuretics, can be due to the use of alcohol and can also be seen in the smokers due to the tobacco use, right? So the Geisbock syndrome is basically the spurious or the relative erythrocytosis that we get in these group of patients, which is secondary to hemoconcentration, right? So this is just a one-liner question that is uh, often asked in your exam and it has been repeated multiple times. So you should be knowing about it, okay? Now, you have this question that you're having a 60-year-old male who developed chest pain and SOB after 10 to 15 days of bed rest. So, investigation of choice is being asked. Look into the question very properly. So, if I'm mentioning that there has been a bed rest, if there is a bed rest that has been mentioned, that means the patient is at high risk of developing a pulmonary embolism. Now, if they are asking you about the initial investigation, if they are asking you about the initial investigation, you can still write D-dimer. You can still write D-dimer, but D-dimer can be increased in a lot of conditions, right? It can be falsely elevated and it has got a negative predictive value. And it has got a negative predictive value. So if it is negative, you are sure that you are not having a pulmonary embolism right but if it is positive it is not giving you anything it is all the more making you confused so the investigation of choice is basically a pulmonary angina is basically a pulmonary angina if pulmonary angina is not given in the question and they are writing ct chest with a contrast if they are giving you ct chest with contrast again this would be the answer Again, this will be answered. So, but the, the motive here is to visualize the vasculature. The motive here is to visualize the vasculature. 
So you have to visualize the vasculature and ultimately look for the thrombus. Ultimately look for the thrombus. What will you get in ECG? In ECG, you are going to get S1, Q3, T3 pattern. In ECG, you are going to get S1, Q3, T3 pattern, which is need, not specific for pulmonary embolism. And if you get it, it's okay. But it's not specific. But the most common ECG finding that you get is a sinus tachycardia. You get is a sinus tachycardia, right? And in the subsequent uh, slides that I'm going to teach you, I'm going to teach you about the pulmonary embolism in detail because you get a lot of questions from that part. Okay. So now you have next question is that you have a, a 60 year old male with a Cushing syndrome, right? So what is the most common cause about it? So first and foremost thing that you need to know that the most common cause of Cushing disease is iatrogenic administration of steroids is the iatrogenic administration of steroids right that is the most common cause of Cushing disease we are talking about the Cushing syndrome if I'm talking about the Cushing syndrome it means excessive cortisol it means excess cortisol that is coming out of pituitary that is coming from the pituitary it is coming from the pituitary tumor. So the question here would be answer would be pituitary adenoma. Would be pituitary adenoma because they have mentioned about Cushing syndrome and they are not asking about Cushing disease. Okay. Even if they ask about Cushing disease with this option, the most common cause of Cushing disease is Cushing syndrome. Most common cause of Cushing disease is ultimately Cushing syndrome. So the answer would not change here. The answer would not change and the answer would remain the same. Okay. So next question that we have, we have a 50 year old lady with hypercalcemia. So increased calcium, increased creatinine. So, and the plasma cells showing more than 40%. We are not going to go into the controversy of the plasma cells. But what they are actually asking you, they are asking you about the CRAB features. So CRAB features stands for elevated calcium, renal failure, anemia, and lytic bone lesions. And lytic bone lesions, these are the features that we see in plasma cell disorders. These are the features that we see in plasma cell disorder. Now, when you are categorizing a plasma cell disorder, it could be of three categories. One is the MGUS, other is the asymptomatic myeloma and it could be a symptomatic myeloma. So when you are having symptomatic myeloma, this means that you are having a feature of CRAB and you are having a clone, clonal plasma cell more than 60%. Whereas in an asymptomatic myeloma, the CRAB will not be there. And the clonal plasma cell percentage would be 10 to 16 percent, 10 to 60 percent. And the other would be MGUS. MGUS means that the clonal plasma cells is less than 10 percent. CRAB is absent and the M band is less than 3 gram. M band is less than 3 gram. So these are the important distinctions that you should be thorough when you are going for the exam. Okay. So next question is. <clears throat> You have an alcoholic patient with pain in the epigastrium and there is radiation to the back. So alcoholic patient with a pain in the epigastrium that is radiating to the back, you have to think of pancreatitis. You have to think of pancreatitis. And the most common cause of acute pancreatitis is gallstones. The most common cause of acute pancreatitis is gallstones. Second is alcoholic. What you get is the elevation in the amylase and lipase level. The lipase levels elevation are more specific for pancreatitis than amylase levels, right? Amylase level can be seen in other conditions also like esophageal perforation. Esophageal perforation, it can also be seen in diabetic ketoacidosis. It can also be seen in diabetic ketoacidosis. What is the clinical sign that you can get? Sometimes you have accumulation of hemorrhage inside the uh, peritoneum you have the hemoperitoneum due to the pancreatitis so you can get a cullen sign so u stands for u you get cullen sign around the umbilicus and you have the turner sign when you have the flanks 
so you turn when you this is like turning so you turn your flanks goes down right so the turner sign is in the flanks the coolant sign is in the umbilicus that's how you can remember so you have a female with a heliotrope rash if i'm talking about the heliotrope rash and unable to comb her hair that means i'm talking about a proximal myopathy proximal muscle weakness which means myopathy so myopathy with a heliotrope rash that means it's talking about the inflammatory myopathy it is talking about the inflammatory myopathy and the inflammatory myopathy that we are talking about is dermatocyte dermatomyositis we are talking here about the dermato myositis okay so the answer to this question would be dermatomyositis and not acle now which ganglion is basically involved in ramsey hunt syndrome the answer is geniculate ganglion the answer is geniculate ganglion okay so the geniculate ganglion is basically involved in ramsey hunt syndrome geniculate ganglion is basically involved in ramsey hunt syndrome which basically gives rise to bell's palsy right so we have uh, discussed the questions that important uh, yeah one more question we have so what are the features of hemolysis in hemolysis what you have to remember is you usually get normal to reduced hemoglobin there would be increase in the bilirubin and mostly it would be increase in the unconjugated fraction you would get splenomegaly you would get splenomegaly but it will be more seen in the extravascular hemolysis it would be more seen in the extravascular hemolysis there will be reticulocytosis if there is a reticulocytosis that would contribute to increased mcv and you will get a de decrease haptoglobin with increased ldh the decrease haptoglobin is is mostly seen in the intravascular hemolysis mostly seen in the intravascular hemolysis right so we are uh, done with mostly the questions here and the subsequent uh, modules that going to come up in the subsequent slides i'm going to teach you some of the important topics that are important for your fmg uh, examination right i will continue with that i'll stop with the questions here and i'll continue with some of the important uh, topics and important chapters that are for your fmg examination hello friends in this module i am going to discuss a very important topic from your exam point of view and that is pulmonary embolism right so before we start with embolism what you need to know are two important thing is whenever there is embolism in the lower vasculature lower limb vasculature we call that as deep vein thrombosis we call that as deep vein thrombosis and the other area where the embolism occur is the pulmonary vasculature and that is known as the pulmonary embolism and that is known as the pulmonary embolism what is important to know here is that if there is untreated dvt if there is untreated dvt this can give rise to pulmonary embolism which can be fatal and life threatening which can be fatal and life threatening right now pulmonary embolism is basically considered as a great masquerader it can be a silent and it can lead to a silent cardiac arrest or it can come with a myriad of symptoms there can be lot of symptoms of which sob is one of them chest pain is another symptom there can be unexplained sob there can be unexplained pleural effusion right so all these things you have to keep in mind whenever you are thinking about pulmonary embolism because pulmonary embolism is a disease entity right which is a great masquerader it can present to you with a very common symptom like a chest pain and still remain undiagnosed if you are not attentive enough to know the risk factors and to know the uh, i mean know this about this condition that this such a condition exists right not only that there are two important other conditions that you need to know about 
and that is a post pulmonary embolism syndrome what do i mean by the post pulmonary embolism syndrome by post pulmonary embolism syndrome we mean that even after the pulmonary embolism has been treated patients continue to have that symptoms of dyspnea and chest pain and that persist and ultimately patients develops a chronic thrombotic pulmonary hypertension so what are the key words here after pulmonary embolism patients report persistent dyspnea and fatigue there is a persistent dyspnea and fatigue and ultimately patient develops a chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension so patients develop a chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension right next is a post thrombotic syndrome a post thrombotic syndrome is basically seen with those patients who have a underlying dvt those who have a underlying dvt they ultimately have the damage to the venous valves of the veins of the lower limb and this basically leads to the vascular insufficiency this basically leads to the vascular insufficiency and ultimately they have a lower limb edema they have a lower limb edema there is venous stasis there is venous stasis and there is skin changes in the form of deep skin alteration deep skin alteration so till here we are clear about two terminologies one is the post pulmonary embolism syndrome and the other is the post thrombotic syndrome okay now we will move to the risk factors that what are the risk factors that can give rise to pulmonary embolism one of them is cancer one of them is cancer other than that you have smoking you have obesity you have hypertension then you have the two c's which is the copd chronic kidney disease not to forget long haul air travel not to forget a long air travel so patients who are not patients rather people sometimes after a long air travel say of 16 hours 18 hours come to with come to us with a sudden onset unexplained chest pain so you need to clear this in your mind that these patients can have a underlying embolism apart from that estrogen excess in any form if there is a estrogen excess in any form be it ocps be it pregnancy or be it a post menopausal hormone replacement therapy pregnancy mostly the puerperium period is the most susceptible period where the patient can develop embolism then you have the surgery and trauma which renders you bedridden which renders you bedridden for certain period of time so when you are bedridden for a certain period of time the likelihood of developing pulmonary embolism increases right the likelihood of developing pulmonary embolism increases so you have around 12 risk factors that you going to keep in mind for the pulmonary embolism why because these risk factors would be clubbed in your question would be clubbed in your question and you're going to be asked about this thing in your exam so for example you have a 40 year old obese male patient who had a recent surgery say 10 days back now comes to you with a sudden onset chest pain okay sudden onset chest pain and sob what would be your further choice of investigation so you know the risk factors obese recent surgery and why the patient is having a chest pain or dyspnea right okay so why actually do we have embolism this comes from your basically the pathology knowledge we know about the virkos triad we know about the virkos triad so virkos triad is basically hev i remember it by mnemonic hepatitis e virus so you have the hypercoagulability you have the endothelial injury and you have the venous stasis and you have the venous stasis so all these three things basically contribute to what is known as the pulmonary embolism the virkos triad this is basically responsible for the formation of embolus this is basically responsible for the formation of embolus right now what do you have to know at in the blood we have something known as a procoagulants and anticoagulants these anticoagulants they 
prevent the formation of the embolus. The prevent the formation of the embolus and procoagulants basically increase the formation of coagulation. They basically increase the formation of embolus. So if there is excess of procoagulants and if there is a decrease anticoagulants, this mechanism, this balance, this balance would ultimately favor the formation of clot and ultimately the embolism. Right. So most common cause of hypercoagulity in our body is factor 5 lead in mutation is factor 5 lead in mutation. Mark this word because this question has been asked repeatedly in your exam that what is the most common cause of a hypercoagulable state. This is the factor 5 lead in mutation. Right. Now, what are the conditions where you can have anticoagulant deficiency? So protein C deficiency. Protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, deficiency of antithrombin, deficiency of antithrombin. All these conditions, if you have a decreased thing, they will basically favor the formation of clot and hence the formation of embolus, right? So this is, you're clear about these things. This is just a revision of your pathology lectures which you have read okay now we will read about the conditions we will read about the conditions that can trigger the formation of embolus pulmonary embolism or dvt till now we read about the risk factors now when i read about the conditions right so one of the conditions that is favoring the formation of embolus is the inflammatory bowel disease is the inflammatory bowel disease so ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, they have one of the side effects of thromboembolism. If you remember my class on inflammatory bowel disease, I mentioned one of the extra intestinal manifestation is thromboembolism. Okay. Then comes your rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis. They are all increased, having increased risk of triggering the formation of embolism. Then you have the diabetes, mellitus, obesity and metabolic syndrome. As obesity itself is one of the risk factors. So there is no denial of the fact that metabolic syndrome, obesity and diabetes, all these can trigger the uh, thromboembolic episodes. Then you have to remember about the hypercholesterolemia. Okay, Lipoprotein, all these things can give rise to formation of an embolus. Pneumonia, one of the systemic infection, right? One of the infections basically we are talking about. So we are coming to infection that can ultimately give rise to formation of an embolus. Acute coronary syndrome, acute stroke, right? All these vascular etiologies, all these vascular etiologies can basically give rise to formation of a PE or DVT, right? Then comes your smoking. Smoking, as I mentioned, is a very important risk factor is a very important risk factor. Then comes your sepsis. Sepsis can give rise to PE, right? So what actually happens in sepsis is we are treating sepsis, right? We are treating sepsis and suddenly the patient who was improving with sepsis in sepsis with antibiotics suddenly deteriorates, right? So in that case, you have to keep in mind whether the patient has developed a pulmonary embolism or not, okay? Then comes your malignancies. Malignancies, I've already mentioned, that is one of the risk factor for the development of embolism okay for the development of embolism okay now what actually is happening in the formation of uh, and the pathogenesis of pulmonary embolism so in the pulmonary embolism there is increase in the pressure inside the heart there is increase in the pressure inside the right ventricle okay inside the right ventricle now as the pressure increases you can see the interventricular septum would ultimately push towards the left ventricle so the iv septum the iv septum will push towards the left side okay so if it push towards the left side what it is ultimately doing is it's decreasing the lv cavity size it's decreasing the lv cavity size and it's decreasing the lv preload so if the preload is decreased, the amount of blood going from or ejected from the, there is decreased ejection from the left ventricle. If it is, there is decreased ejection, there will be decreased blood in the systemic circulation and ultimately you are going to have hypotension. 
and ultimately you're going to have hypotension. So this is basically the pathophysiology behind the development of a massive pulmonary embolism. Behind the development of massive pulmonary embolism. So massive pulmonary embolism basically presents to you with a hypotension or a circulatory circulatory collapse they present to you with hypotension or circulatory collapse right now we were talking about a massive embolism we are talking about a septum going to this side now just imagine you have a patent foramen ovalia you have a patent foramen ovalia so what's going to happen this embolus is going to go to the left side of your circulation this embolus which was previously present in the right circulation is going to go to the left side of the circulation and can go to the different areas where your arteries are going so you can have even unexplained strokes you can even have unexplained or cryptogenic strokes due to the presence of patent foramen oval right so dvt ultimately going to the lungs from the lungs via pfo it can go to the left ventricle and this can go to the various areas this can go to the various area. This phenomenon is known as a paradoxical embolization. A paradoxical embolization. Why? Because embolus has gone from vein to the arterial territory. It has gone into the arterial territory, right? So that's why it is called as a paradoxical embolization. So this is paradoxical embolization. Now, what you have to know is we are dividing pulmonary embolism into three categories, into three categories, right? We are dividing it into a massive pulmonary embolism or a sub-massive pulmonary embolism and is the third is the low-risk pulmonary embolism. So what is happening in the massive pulmonary embolism if in the question it is mentioned that your patient is having a hypotension your patient is having a hypotension or a circulatory collapse that patient is having a massive pulmonary embolism and by definition when the 50 percent of the pulmonary vasculature is affected when the 50 percent of the pulmonary vasculature is affected that stuff is known as a massive pulmonary embolism if you just have a rv dysfunction and your blood pressure is normal and your blood pressure is normal then we think about a submassive pulmonary embolism. Then comes the low risk pulmonary embolism where you don't even have an RV dysfunction or you have a mild RV dysfunction and the blood pressure is definitely normal. And the blood pressure is definitely normal. So what is the clear cut technique to classify pulmonary embolism? Suppose I have a patient of a pulmonary embolism in front of me in my ward. What is the, uh, what is the, Test. What is the bedside test which you do to know whether this patient is stable or unstable, right? So to know whether your patient is stable or unstable, you have to rely on your blood pressure measurement. So the blood pressure is normal in a stable patient and you have hypotension in an unstable patient. So hypotension in unstable patient. Now, this is important to know because your management is going to change. Your management is going to change, right? Now, frequently, the most common site of DVT is basically the lower extremity DVT, right? There is no doubt about it. So, if you're asked most common site of DVT, it is the lower extremities, right? But upper extremity DVTs are rare, although can happen although can happen with increased advancements that we are seeing in the cardiology section and in the nephrology section, right? Increased use of the catheters, dialysis catheters and uh, the perma gats and all. So, and in the cardiology sector, increased use of pacemakers, ICDs and all. The upper limb DVTs are becoming also common. They are rare, but they are becoming common, right? So you have to remember the causes of upper extremity DVT. First of all, it's rare, but what are the causes of upper extremity DVT? So if you get a DVT in upper extremity, that's a very rare thing. But you have to remember that no further risk factors, whether the patient is having an underlying pacemaker, 
see whether the patient is having a defibrillator or see whether the patient is having an indwelling central venous catheter or an indwelling central venous catheter because all these are risk factors for the development of upper extremity DVT. Okay. Now, as I've already mentioned that pulmonary embolism is a great masquerader. It's a great masquerader. So we will just look how we suspect and we move forward with a diagnosis of DVT or pulmonary embolism, right? So I'll just mention that a very important test that we do in the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism is the D-dimer and the uh, further imaging tests we are going to uh, discuss about, right? So first and foremost, you have to assess the clinical likelihood, okay? That what is the clinical likelihood of patient developing a DVT or a pulmonary embolism? So for that, we have this table. For that, we have this table. What is important to remember is there is a high likelihood, there is a high likelihood if your score is more than 3. If your score is more than 3, more than equal to 3, that is the very important number that you have to remember. So what are the risk factors that decide the clinical decision rules? You have to remember this as CDR. So what are the risk factors that decide whether your patient is having a high likelihood or a low likelihood for development of DVT? So active cancer. If your patient is having an active malignancy, then there is a chances you give one point. Second is you had a paralysis, paresis or recent cast. That means you had a fracture. That means you had a fracture and you were put on cast. Then comes you have been bedridden for more than three days and you had a major surgery less than three months back. So major surgery less than three months back. All these risk factors we have uh, read about it. You are having tenderness along distribution of deep veins. You are having tenderness along distribution of deep veins. You have an entire leg swelling. You have an entire leg swelling. Although DVT initially presents with a calf swelling, but ultimately it can become an entire leg swelling. Then comes you have a unilateral calf swelling that is more than 3 cm. So a unilateral calf swelling that is more than 3 cm. Then there is a pitting edema. There is a pitting edema and you have a collateral superficial non-varicose veins. So collateral superficial non-varicose vein and alternative diagnosis at least as likely as DVT. So you give minus point for that. So in this entire variables, what are different dif difficulties to remember is entire leg swelling, pitting edema and a collateral superficial non-varicose vein. So these three points are there which you won't, which you find a bit difficult to memorize, a bit difficult. So in uh, read karte samay, in three points ko yaad rakho, baaki cheez to you can easily manage in your exam. Ki patient had paresis, paralysis, was bedridden for more than three days, had a major surgery less than three months back and uh, active cancer is there. So all these things aapko yaad rahega, but ye three points aapko yaad nahi rahega, theek hai? So what you have to remember is the, Point score is zero or less. If it is zero or less, right? If it is zero or less, the likelihood is low. If it is one to two, it is moderate. And if it is more than three, then the likelihood is high. So high likelihood of developing a DVT or pulmonary embolism. Okay. So that is one of the case, right? High likelihood for DVT. This is for DVT. And the other one is for the PE. It is for PE. So if your score exceeds 4. So 3 more than 3 for DVT. And more than 4 for pulmonary embolism. The questions are the clinical variables are mostly similar. So you have signs and symptoms of DVT. Alternative diagnosis less likely than pulmonary embolism. You have a tachycardia. You have a tachycardia. You have been immobilized for more than three days. You had a surgery within four weeks. You had a prior history of PE or DVT. You are having a hemoptysis and you are having a cancer. So these are the risk factors and variables that can give rise to pulmonary embolism or DVT. Now we'll come back to this table which we are uh, discussing. So if you are having a low likelihood of a DVT, then you are going to do the D-dimer. You're going to do the D-dimer if it is negative. Now, let me tell you about the D-dimer. What is importance of D-dimer? D-dimer is not useful for diagnosis, but it is useful for 
excluding the diagnosis right what i mean by here is dvt is having a very good value for excluding the diagnosis if d dimer if d dimer is not raised if d dimer is negative that means it uh, there is no underlying dvt that is there is no underlying dvt but if the d dimer is raised that is not giving you any good point it is not giving you a good point because d dimer can be falsely elevated in lot of conditions so it has got a very good false negative predictive value it has got a very good negative predictive value rather i should say so d dimer has got a very good negative predictive value right these things you have already read in your psm lectures right what is the negative predictive value and all so if it is negative that means if negative dvt or pe is unlikely or unlikely right so this is a important point that you have to remember so if you have a low likelihood for d uh, dvt go for d dimer if it is normal then this is no dvt this is very important right but if it's high you again have to go for imaging test you again have to go for imaging test right so basically d dimer becomes a kind of a screening test kind of becomes a screening test for those conditions where the probability is low but if it is not low then there is no use of doing a dvt uh, d dimer just go for the imaging test similarly in pulmonary embolism if your chances are high you don't have to do a d dimer you just have to go for the imaging test you just have to go for the imaging test to diagnose because d dimer has got a negative predictive value has got a negative predictive value so it basically functions as a screening test it basically functions kind of as a screening test okay but in only those patients where the likelihood of developing these conditions is low now what is actually happening with the ecg in ecg what we get is a s1 q3 t3 pattern so you have got s wave in lead 1 you have got q wave in lead 3 and you got t wave inversion in lead 3 so this pattern is kind of uh, non specific this is kind of non specific for pulmonary embolism it is seen in pulmonary embolism but it is not very specific for pulmonary embolism so this is one of the questions that are often repeatedly asked in exam you have to remember this thing right s1 q3 t3 pattern is there so what it also explain i will if i ask you what is the most common pattern that is seen in pulmonary embolism the answer would be sinus tachycardia the an answer would be sinus tachycardia sometimes it may so happen that in icu you have a unexplained tachycardia you have a unexplained tachy in a icu patient who has just recovered for sepsis think about pulmonary embolism think about pulmonary embolism okay next comes the diagnostic things i've already mentioned that if it is positive if it is positive think about those conditions where it is falsely elevated but if it is negative if it is negative it has got a very good negative predictive value so that means there is no dvt or a pulmonary embolism now what are the conditions where dvt or d dimer can be falsely elevated these conditions are myocardial infarction it can be elevated in sepsis it can be elevated in cancer it can be elevated in post operative state it can be elevated in pneumonia now if you remember the table that we read pneumonia was one of the infection which can give rise to dvt or pe so pneumonia itself can cause elevated d dimer and the second to third trimester of pregnancy can also give rise to falsely elevated d dimer so this is a very important causes and that you have to remember that what are the conditions that lead to falsely elevated d dimer values apart from that what are the other investigation modalities that we have so ecg we have discussed about that you can get a sinus tachy and we have discussed about the s1 q3 t3 pattern now if you do the echocardiography is it reliable no it's not reliable but what it gives you or rv dyskinesia it lets you about rv dyskinesia it tells you about the rv dysfunction it gives you an idea about the right ventricular size it gives you an idea about the 
right ventricular side now what you have is a something known as a mcconnell sign remember about mcconnell sign so mcconnell sign means you have the wall motion abnormality so rv regional wall motion about abnormality if it is there with apical sparing without the involvement of the apex without the involvement of apex is meant by the mcconnell sign it's the meant by mcconnell sign now regional wall motion abnormality of right ventricle you can also see in right ventricular ami you can also see in right ventricular ami now if the apex is being spared then that means the pulmonary embolism is there now we are going to discuss about the three classical signs that we get in pulmonary embolism now these are the signs that are classically described but the most common presentation that you see in the chest x-ray would be normal most common presentation that you want to see in chest x-ray it would be normal right now what actually happens in the x-ray that you get a wedge shaped opacity which is a plural based opacity and this is seen in the this is known as the hampton's hump this is known as the hampton's hump another condition is where you get hyperemic lung field in one side and oligemic lung field in the other side so you are getting a oligemic lung field in the other side right now this oligemic lung field is basically the area where you have the pulmonary embolism where you have the pulmonary embolism now this is basically known as the wester mark sign this is basically known as the wester mark sign okay and if you have a prominence of the descending pulmonary artery you have the prominence of the descending pulmonary artery this is known as the palla sign this is known as the palla sign so these are the signs which you can see in pulmonary embolism right but the most common type of x ray the most common presentation in x ray would be a normal x ray would be a normal x ray right that's why we call pulmonary embolism as a great masquerader as a great masquerader now we finally come to the what is the investigation of choice the investigation of choice is chest ct it's not d diamond so don't make that mistake in your exam that what is the investigation of choice of pulmonary embolism it is the chest ct which you have to do with the contrast so you have to give iv contrast with uh in this condition right if you are doing a high resolution chest ct it's well and good right if you are doing a high resolution chest ct it's well and good right but ultimately you have to see the vasculature here right you ultimately you have to see the vasculature so both the options if you are given in your exam would be correct right but you won't be confused by giving chest ct and hrct in your options another thing that you can do is a ventilation perfusion scan is the ventilation perfusion scan normally what happens is the pulmonary vasculature is affected so you're going to have absent perfusion here you're going to have absent perfusion here with a normal ventilation with a normal ventilation this pattern is you will see in pulmonary embolism and ventilation is affected then you can think that there would be an underlying respiratory etiology that is there that if the ventilation is affected you can think of that there is a underlying respiratory etiology that is affecting the ventilation that it could be a copd or it could be a pneumonia or it could be a asthma or it could be a asthma right now what imaging modality will you do to diagnose dvt well you have to do a ultrasonography and do a venous doppler study of lower limb venous doppler study of lower limb right now most of us most of the practicing physician whenever they think of dvt what they have a common practice is of sending patient for a arterial or venous study my question is why you are suspecting deep venous thrombosis so why do you want to go for a arterial study you are not suspecting a peripheral vascular disease so don't do this mistake in your internship or in your practice whenever you are doing this if you are suspecting a dvt kindly just send for the venous doctor only not for the arterial study right now we'll come to the management part as i've already told you pulmonary embolism we divide into massive submassive or stable unstable so it is very important to know whether your disease is a stable disease or a unstable disease in your exam you're going to be asked about the management strategies for both 
So first we will discuss about the massive pulmonary embolism or the unstable disease. So what you have to know is these patients usually have hypotension. These patients present to you with a hypotension or a circulatory collapse, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to give them some amount of intravenous saline. So intravenous saline will be your first step. Giving them hydration would be your first step. But what you have to also remember is you cannot load them with aggressive fluids. Why? Again, the same thing that I told you, give more fluids, the pressure in the right ventricle is going to rise, it's going to compress the left ventricle and it's going to cause hypotension. So you're going to treat the, you want to treat the hypotension and ultimately you're going to worsen it. So basically you start with 500 ml of NS, then you put the patient on vasopressor support. It could be a noradrenaline or it could be a dobutamine or it could be a dobutamine. And in this case, you have to go for a systemic thrombolytic therapy. You have to go for systemic thrombolytic therapy. Here, you have to go for IV RTPA, right? In stroke, we have discussed IV RTPA that we give within 4.5 hours and the dose is 0 0.9. 0 0.9 maximum, we go up to 90 mg. Here, we can go for 100 mg or 50 mg infusion that is to be given up to 2 hours. And we have the provision that we can give up to 14 days. We can give up to 14 days, right? 14 days. And in the stroke, it was mostly the hours. Okay. So we can give up to the 14 days. But if we have a submassive pulmonary embolism or a stable pulmonary embolism, we can treat them with anticoagulation. In one line, just remember, treat them with anticoagulants. What is the strategy that we follow? We start with a parenteral therapy. We start with a parenteral therapy. And then we add oral noax or vitamin k antagonist or vitamin k antagonist right now the reason or the strategy behind giving a switch therapy this is kind of a bridge therapy rather this is a kind of a bridge therapy is the warfarin therapy the warfarin takes two to five days it takes two to five days for the inr to increase it takes two to five days for the INR to increase, right? So in those five days, what we're going to do is increase the INR by giving parenteral heparin or low molecular weight heparin, right? So if you're asked in your exam treatment of a massive pulmonary embolism, answer is thrombolytic therapy. If you're asked about initial therapy, if you're asked about initial therapy of uh, unstable, if you're asked about the initial therapy of an unstable uh, pulmonary embolism, answer is give them IV saline. And if you're asked about a definitive therapy, then this is thrombolytic therapy. If you're asked about a stable or a submassive pulmonary infusion, the treatment of choice is anticoagulation. Now, what has changed in the recent guidelines is the duration of the therapy. Is the duration of the therapy. The words that were previously used provoked and unprovoked. The words that were previously used provoked and unprovoked are not being used now. So I've got an evidence for you, right? So this is basically taken from your uh, Harrison uh, latest edition. So what they are saying is the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. They have done away with the unprovoked and provoked DVT all permanent also. So what they are suggesting is you put the patient on an indefinite duration. You put the patient on an indefinite duration of anticoagulants, especially in those conditions where you have the first episode of PE and you have no identifiable risk factor. You did not get any risk factor, right? Now, if you have a persistent risk factor, like say active malignancy, so the patients who are on active malignancy, they should be put on indefinite uh, anticoagulants till the time your cancer is being there in the body or treated or not, right? So active malignancy patients have to be put on an indefinite TVT. Don't, they don't have a specific duration. And another thing would be minor transient or a reversible risk factor. So there are three conditions. There are three conditions where you have to put the patient on an extended oral anticoagulation. You have to put the patient on an extended oral anticoagulation and the terminology provoked versus unprovoked has been removed, has been removed. Okay.
now we will come to this fact where we are discussing the bridge therapy we are discussing about the bridge therapy we have discussed that when we are treating a submassive pulmonary embolism the treatment of choice is basically anticoagulants the treatment of choice is anticoagulants right so this basically brings us to the uh, end of the module i just end with uh, one more information that you need to know one of them is ivc filters when you shall use ivc filters well you need to know that there are two conditions so anticoagulation giving anticoagulation would give rise to bleeding episodes would give rise to bleeding right so the side effects of giving anticoagulants is bleeding so if you are having a active bleeding that precludes the use of your anticoagulants you have to use ivc filters second would be if you are having a recurrent venous thrombosis despite intensive anticoagulation you give the anticoagulation and the inr was being maintained for 2 to 3 with optimal duration and optimal therapy with optimal duration and optimal therapy still the patient developed a recurrent venous thrombosis in those case the ivc filters need to be put in use right so this basically brings us to the end of the module on pulmonary embolism it's a very important module what you need to remember and revise is what are the radiological signs that you will get from the radiological signs that we have discussed the ecg sign that we have discussed that we have discussed about the d dimer we have discussed about the d dimer the negative predictive value that you need to know and you have to know the treatment of the massive or the unstable pulmonary embolism you have to know the treatment of submassive pulmonary embolism you have to remember the treatment of submassive pulmonary embolism right so these are the must know areas from this module okay hello friends now we're going to talk about bronchiectasis which is also a very important topic from your exam point of view right so what actually is bronchiectasis bronchiectasis basically means there is a irreversible dilatation there is a irreversible dilatation and mind it there is no destruction of the airways there is usually no destruction of airways okay so this is a very important thing to know that this is a case where you have irreversible airway dilatation now this dilatation can be of two broad categories it could be focal or it could be generalized okay now we're going to discuss about the two causes focal and generalized in focal you have two classification where it could be extrinsic or it could be intrinsic so don't worry we're going to discuss about it in the subsequent slide but these are two broad categories of classification of bronchiectasis that is focal and generalized and it is basically categorized into four types it is basically categorized into four types i remember it by a mnemonic ctvs so what is ctvs s stands for cystic s stands for cystic so we are not using c here we are using the s here v stands for the varicose variety this stands for the varicose variety t stands for the tubular variety and c stands for the cylindrical variety c stands for the cylindrical variety so these are the four types of bronchiectasis now you're going to be asked which is the most common type which is the most common type of bronchiectasis the answer is tubular the answer is tubular now as we discussed we can have two types of bronchiectasis one is focal and the other is generalized now the focal bronchiectasis can be divided into a extrinsic bronchiectasis due to the extrinsic cause and due to the intrinsic cause so what i actually mean here suppose these are the airways these are the airways any cause that is inside the airway any cause that is inside the airway would be an intrinsic cause and anything that is outside the airway anything that is outside the airway anything that is outside the airway would comprise the extrinsic cause so you can see any tumor or any lymph node that is outside the airway would give rise to a focal bronchiectasis would give rise to a focal bronchiectasis Are you going to tell sir? You going to tell me sir? There is a lymph node compression from the adjacent side, so it is not causing dilatation. So sir, why are you calling that there is a bronchiectasis? So tell, let me tell you, friends, 
what will happen is if you compress one airway there will be compensatory dilatation of the other surrounding airway so that's why we are having a focal bronchiectasis and intrinsic would be if there is any airway tumor so inside if you have any tumor if any tumor is there if any foreign body impaction is there if any foreign body impaction is there that airway will compact uh, come i mean collapse and the surrounding airway would basically expand giving rise to a focal bronchiectasis right focal bronchiectasis now we have read about the focal bronchiectasis now we will read about the diffuse or the generalized bronchiectasis or the generalized bronchiectasis so friends what you have to remember is there are certain infectious etiology okay there is certain infectious etiology there is certain immunodeficiency which can give rise to a uh, bronchiectasis then we have the certain genetic causes one of them is the cystic fibrosis carter jenner syndrome alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency then we have the autoimmune cause then we have the autoimmune cause where you have the rheumatoid arthritis zogren inflammatory bowel disease abpa abpa okay then we have the recurrent aspiration and we have the idiopathic idiopathic now after telling you everything it will be very surprising and a very comedy thing to tell you that the most common cause would be idiopathic most common causes idiopathic okay so we are unable to find the etiology in maximum of the cases in maximum of the cases so that is known as idiopathic bronchiectasis that is known as the idiopathic bronchiectasis okay so what are the infections that can give rise to bronchiectasis one of them is bacterial infection and you have to forget that uh, you cannot forget about the non tubular non tuberculous mycobacteria non tuberculous mycobacteria forms a important cause of diffuse bronchiectasis then comes the immunodeficiency syndromes where those conditions where you have decreased globulin there you have decreased globulin they form a important cause they form a important cause of generalized bronchiectasis generalized bronchiectasis one of them is hiv infection one of them is hiv infection and we have certain genetic cause which is the cystic fibrosis and the carter jenner syndrome okay and the carter jenner syndrome okay now we will move further that based on certain areas which can be involved we can have upper lobe bronchiectasis we can have mid lobe bronchiectasis and we can have central bronchiectasis now central airway bronchiectasis is a highly characteristic feature of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is a very high characteristic feature of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis non tubular mycobacteria especially in it affects the adults it affects the adults which are more than i should say elderly which are more than 50 years and this give rise to mid lung field bronchiectasis this give rise to mid lung field bronchiectasis okay and there are certain conditions and there are certain conditions which give rise to upper lobe bronchiectasis upper lobe bronchiectasis and this is cystic fibrosis and the post radiation fibrosis so cystic fibrosis is a cause of bronchiectasis in adolescents it is a cause of bronchiectasis in adolescents whereas non tubular micro non tuberculous mycobacteria is the cause of bronchiectasis is a cause of bronchiectasis in elderly in elderly okay now what actually is the pathogenesis pathogenesis is basically the vicious cycle there is a vicious cycle by which infection by which infection leads to impaired mucociliary clearance if the mucociliary clearance is impaired that infection will not be thrown out of the system and that infection will ultimately lead to colonization and further infection and further infection so this basically is the vicious cycle of infection in bronchiectasis now what are the organisms that you need to remember that are colonizing our respiratory tract in bronchiectasis one of them is pseudomonas there is pseudomonas the second is bordetella and third is mycoplasma and the third is mycoplasma so you have to remember these three organisms 
that are basically colonizing or respiratory tract in bronchiectasis okay next comes what are the clinical features of bronchiectasis so bronchiectasis patients they present to you with persistent productive cough they come to you with a persistent productive cough and a very important history that you're going to get from your uh, patient is they change with the change of posture they change with the change of posture right and there is ongoing production of a very thick tenacious sputum there is ongoing production of a very thick tenacious sputum and what you have to remember is the sputum is not foul smelling the sputum is not foul smelling the foul smelling sputum is characteristic of lung abscess which we have discussed in a different module right so what you're going to get in your history is that the patient is having a persistent productive cough and do, do not forget the other c that you have to remember it is the clubbing it is the clubbing so persistent productive cough in a patient with clubbing when where you are getting certain respiratory findings like wheeze crackles think of bronchiectasis think of bronchiectasis and if there is a acute exacerbation of bronchiectasis then there going to be change in volume of sputum there will be change in volume there will be change in purulence and there will be change in color so three things are going to change if there is a acute exacerbation of bronchiectasis so these patients are prone to develop acute infections these patients are prone to develop acute infections right so they are very prone to have repeated exacerbations they are very prone to have repeated exacerbations so how will you diagnose whether your patient is having bronchiectasis or not so guys the modality of choice is ct chest the modality of choice is ct chest and if you are given a high resolution ct scan in your option then that going to be the that going to be the answer apart from that what are you going to get in a ct scan we are going to discuss that and we will discuss certain image based questions related to that so you are going to get a tram track appearance you are going to get tram track appearance another t that you have to remember is tree in bird pattern tree in bird pattern and the third sign that you have to remember is the signet ring sign well this black part is basically the airway and this red part is basically the vasculature so if the airway diameter if the airway diameter is 1.5 times if the airway diameter is 1.5 times of the vasculature then we call it a bronchiectasis and this is known as a signet ring sign this is known as a signet ring sign so if you look into this ct that has been given so one of your image based question so what you are getting here here is this cylindrical pattern you are getting this pattern of bronchiectasis and you can see very large airways you can see this large airways so this is a very highly characteristic feature of bronchiectasis right so this is a image based question that you need to keep in mind for bronchiectasis okay now what you have to remember is hiv negative patients hiv negative patients especially if they are more than 50 years of age more than 50 years of age and if they are harboring if they are harboring a non tubular non tubercular mycobacteria then they are mostly having the mac that is the mycobacterium avium complex so in they, those cases the treatment would be to give a combined macrolide along with rifampin and etambutol so in that case what you have to give is a combination of macrolide combined with rifampin and etambutol that would be the treatment strategy apart from that what you have to do is maintain a bronchial hygiene now this patients have thick tenacious sputum this patient have thick tenacious sputum so what you need to do is give them proper hydration you have to use some hyper osmolar agents and mucolytic agents like dorneys which are used to uh, simplify or make the thick mucus thin make the thick mucus thin and what you have to do is regular posture change you have to do the regular posture change and chest physiotherapy these are all part of non pharmacologic therapy these are all part of non pharmacologic therapy right 
Now, when will you use the pharmacologic therapy? When will you use the pharmacologic therapy? The pharmacologic therapy is basically directed towards the prevention strategies. We're going to come to that. The prevention strategies involve giving patients vaccination. So you give influenza and pneumococcal vaccination. You're going to give smoking cessation. You're going to give advice and make smoking cessation in the patient. And if the patient is immunodeficient, and is having recurrent bronchiectasis exacerbation, you have to give them IVIG. You have to give them IVIG. Apart from that, if there are three or more episodes, if there are three or more episodes of exacerbation, so the patients where you have more than three episodes of exacerbation, of exacerbation, you have to put them on suppressive antibiotics. You have to put them on, on suppressive antibiotics because... The fact if you have exacerbation in a patient of bronchitis, that exacerbation can lead to a very bad worsening in those patients, can lead to very bad worsening, can lead to prolonged antibiotics, can lead to underlying sepsis. So you have to prevent the exacerbation in those group of patients. So how do we do that? You can either put the patient on oral ciprofloxacin on one to two weeks per month we have a lot of options one of the options is giving oral ciprofloxacin you give them two weeks so two weeks on and two weeks off right then you can use a rotating schedule of antibiotics why we are giving rotating schedule is we are giving rotating schedule because we can prevent the development of resistance so we give one uh, form of antibiotic and we rotate the next time we are giving different type of antibiotic so, or you can put the patient on oral macrolide three times per week. So, three days on and four days off. That's one schedule. Another thing could be you can give them aerosolized antibiotic. That's another antibiotics. We can give by the form of aerosols, by the form of aerosols. You are not giving them uh, in the form of oral or IV, but you are giving them by the form of or uh, aerosols. So, you give them mostly the gram-negative coverage on glycosides, and that is the tobramycin. Here we have 30 days on and 30 days off. So you give the aerosols for one month and then you have the one month off. And then you have the one month off, right? Next could be giving the IV antibiotics. You're giving IV antibiotics and that is given basically for the wash out of organisms, right? So this is all about bronchiectasis. Let's just quickly revise the image based questions. Let's quickly revise the image-based question. So we have discussed about the CTVS. So we have the cylindrical form. We have the tubular form, which happens to be the most common type. We have the varicose and we have the cystic variant and we have the cystic variant. And what are the radiological signs that we know about? We have the tram track appearance. We have the tram track appearance. We have the tree in bird pattern. We have the tree in bird pattern and we have the signet ring sign and we have the signet ring sign. Okay. So these are the three radiological signs that we know about. Okay. So this image, this HRCT is basically showing you the tram track appearance. So this is a classical city of a tram track appearance. So you are having a tram track appearance. Okay. Next, if you can see that this is basically the pulmonary artery and look at the size of the pulmonary, look at the size of the airway. So this is basically the diameter of the airway is 1.5 times the diameter of the pulmonary artery or the vasculature or the vasculature. So this is known as signet ring sign. This is known as the signet ring sign and this is basically seen in bronchiectasis. So from bronchitis, if you can remember the image based questions that I have just uh, discussed, I think it would be fine enough. Plus what you have to remember is the different preventive antibiotic regimens that I spoke about, right? So this basically brings us to the end of this interesting module on bronchitis. Hello friends, this is another important exam topic that is cystic fibrosis. You can expect one or two questions from this part of uh, the module in your exam with special emphasis on the diagnosis part and the genetics part. They keep on asking this uh, questions from this area regularly, right? So what actually is uh, cystic fibrosis? 
so cystic fibrosis is basically a autosomal recessive disease that causes multi system involvement that causes multi system involvement and is a exocrinopathy and is a exocrinopathy so what is actually having in cystic fibrosis is you have a anion channel which is the cftr which is the cftr this anion channel is basically responsible for maintaining the volume and composition of the fluids so this is basically responsible for maintaining the volume and composition of fluids that are secreted by the exocrine glands that are being secreted by the exocrine glands right and as i've already discussed that this affects multiple organs this affects multiple organs now most common organ to be affected the most common organ system to be affected from the cystic fibrosis is respiratory system is respiratory system and second most common organ to be affected second most common organ to be affected is pancreas is pancreas now with this basic introduction in mind we are going to proceed further we are going to proceed further so what are the things that we know about the respiratory manifestations so first thing we know that this is the most common site of involvement this is the most common site of involvement right so what is actually happening here is there is pulmonary compromise in cftr what is actually happening is there is copious hyperviscous and adherent secretions there is copious hyperviscous and adherent secretions that are difficult to clear that are difficult to clear so if the secretions are difficult to clear what will ultimately happen is this is going to uh, favor the colonization this is going to favor the colonization of certain microbial organisms this is going to favor the colonization of certain microbial organism so what you have to remember is whenever you are strictly asked in exam which organisms are most commonly involved and most commonly colonized in cystic fibrosis we have a habit of jumping into pseudomonas aeruginosa so what you need to remember is apart from pseudomonas aeruginosa there are certain other organisms also that are involved so you have staph aureus and very frequently we encounter methicillin resistant staph aureus strains that are colonized in patients of cystic fibrosis you have haemophilus influenza you have haemophilus influenza and you have the pseudomonas aeruginosa now what is important to know about pseudomonas aeruginosa is this organism basically evolves in patients of uh, cystic fibrosis it evolves in patient of cystic fibrosis it evolves in patients of cystic fibrosis and ultimately the secretion that comes out it turns out to be a mucoid it turns out to be mucoid so whatever the secretions are coming out from the bacterium it basically becomes some mucoid phenotype right so important take home message from here is just don't remember pseudomonas aeruginosa as the organism that is colonizing the respiratory tract in cystic fibrosis we have other organisms as well okay apart from that we have the pancreas so as i've already mentioned that the second most common organism to be in uh, second most common organ system to be involved is basically the pancreas if the pancreas is involved what you can expect the pancreas is basically having two important parts it is having the exocrine part and it is having the endocrine part so if the endocrine part is affected you will land up into diabetes mellitus you're going to land up into diabetes mellitus and that is seen in 30% of the patients and that is seen in the 30% of the patients whereas the exocrine component basically give rise to the pancreatic insufficiency so this gives rise to the pancreatic insufficiency and ultimately you're going to have malabsorption syndrome that will lead to poor growth and as the pancreatic enzymes are responsible for the fat absorption so you're going to have deficiency of the 
fat soluble vitamins right so this basically comes from the exocrine component these manifestation comes from the exocrine component right so till now we are clear okay now there are other organ systems also that are involved so as i'm saying it's a multi system involvement so there are other organ systems that are also involved so this can give rise to multi lobular cirrhosis this can give rise to multi lobular cirrhosis what you have to remember apart from that is another m and that give rise to meconium ileus so meconium ileus can also be a manifestation of cystic fibrosis right so meconium ileus can also be a manifestation of cystic fibrosis and then comes the infertility then comes the infertility as the there is complete involution of vas deferens there is complete involution of vas deferens so this basically leads to infertility this basically leads to infertility and the sinusitis is also another manifestation sinusitis is also another manifestation so apart from the respiratory tree apart from the lower respiratory tree that we have discussed this is also involving the upper respiratory tract and it is also involving our sinus it is also involving our sinuses giving rise to sinusitis giving rise to sinusitis so multiple organ manifestations we have discussed about the respiratory we have discussed about the pancreas we have discussed about the sinus we have discussed about the gi tract we have discussed about the genito urinary tract also and last but not the least remember the 2m remember the 2m it is leading to multi lobular cirrhosis multilobular cirrhosis and it is leading to meconium ileus it is also causing meconium ileus right so these are the common clinical manifestations of cystic fibrosis now we will move into the molecular genetics now this area is very important as they ask you questions regularly from this area so what is happening in the molecular genetics part is there is a mutation in the f508 area so f508 deletion mutation is the common mutation that is we are encountering in around 70 to 80% of the mutation analysis so cftr mutation analysis cftr mutation analysis when you do in the patient what you are getting is f508 deletion mutation f508 deletion mutation and what is happening is there is a omission of a single feline alanine residue so remember both the things are asked so you have to remember f508 deletion also and you have to also remember that which amino acid is involved so there is omission of phenyl alanine residue there is omission of phenyl alanine residue right so these both are important areas and the questions have been asked repeatedly from this area the questions have been asked repeatedly from this area so kindly remember this number and kindly remember the amino acid which i am talking about okay then comes the pathogenesis so till now i have been telling you that there is sinusitis there is respiratory tract involvement i have been speaking about exocrinopathy so this let me tell you why the secretions are basically getting thick in cystic fibrosis so what is actually happening here is you see there is epithelial cells there is presence of cilia there is presence of cilia right there is presence of cilia so what is happening is there is if you look into the secretions that is normally present it is the it has a mucus layer and it has a peri capillary fluid layer it has a peri capillary fluid layer now what does this peri capillary fluid layer do now this peri capillary fluid layer is present below the mucus layer which is a jelly like thing so mucus layer below which you have the peri capillary fluid layer so this peri capillary fluid layer allows the, allows the cilia to move and helps and hence helps in the clearance so you have the mucus layer you have the peri capillary fluid layer beneath that you have the cilia so because of this peri capillary fluid layer the cilia can move and hence cause the secretions or any organism to move out and prevent the colonization so this is the protective mechanism of the body now what is happening in cystic fibrosis is this peri capillary fluid layer is deficient 
so this pericapillary fluid layer is deficient in patients of cystic fibrosis and this basically causes the secretions to become thick and there is colonization of the microorganisms and there is the colonization of the microorganisms so i hope you guys are very much clear about the pathogenesis of cystic fibrosis why do we actually get thick secretions why do we actually get thick secretions in patients of cystic fibrosis now comes the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis how are you going to diagnose so you all have read in the pediatrics about the newborn screening program we have newborn screening techniques that we have for cystic fibrosis so what is actually having happening is this cftr gene the cftr channel is basically allowing the chloride channel is it is basically allowing the chloride ion to move inside if it's not happening what is happening is there is sweat emerges on the skin with excess chloride so you have excess chloride right so levels of chloride in sweat basically is increased in patients of cystic fibrosis compared to non cystic fibrosis the mechanism i have already explained so what you do is a sweat chloride test the sweat chloride test is highly specific is highly specific for cystic fibrosis as the chloride is not entering as the chloride ion is not entering inside what is happening is this is emerging above the skin into the sweat and the sweat chloride levels are markedly elevated so they are markedly elevated so another mcq that you get from this area and uh, once you have done the sweat chloride test then you can go for the mutation analysis so there are two ways by which you can diagnose is one is the sweat chloride test one is the sweat chloride test and other is the mutation analysis of and other is the mutation analysis of cftr so these are the two ways by which you can diagnose the cystic fibrosis okay next comes the management part the management part is very important i told you it's a multi system involvement so when you are having the involvement of pancreas what you need to do is you have to give them enzyme supplementation you have to give them enzyme supplementation because ultimately it's giving rise to chronic pancreatitis it's giving rise to a chronic pancreatitis a chronic pancreatitic insufficiency second is you have to for the respiratory part as there is colonization you have to administer oral or aerosolized antibiotics you have to give them oral or aerosolized antibiotics and since the secretions are getting thick the secretions are getting thick the pcl is deficient the perimucal perimucal gland is deficient which we talk about the periciliary fluid layer that we talk about the periciliary fluid layer is deficient so what is actually happening here is the pcl depth periciliary fluid layer depth needs to be increased and that is being assessed by that is being basically achieved by the dna's aerosols and hypertonic saline so that is being basically achieved by the dna's aerosols and the hypertonic saline right so thick pcl is basic uh, thick secretions come basically from the deficient pcl comes from the deficient pericapillary fluid layer right another important part that we have also discussed in bronchitis is the chest physiotherapy part that you need to do in patients of cystic fibrosis you have to also need to do the cystic fibrosis you have to do chest physiotherapy okay now comes the malabsorption part so as the malabsorption part is there in patients of uh, cystic fibrosis so what you need to do is along with the enzyme supplementation that you are doing for uh, patients of chronic pancreatitis and and the enzyme sufficiency is and the as the uh, pancreatic insufficiency is there so what you are doing is giving them the enzyme supplementation apart from that you will also get certain fat uh, deficiency you're going to have the deficiency of fat soluble vitamins so what you need to do is you have to give them calcium since they're going to have decreased calcium and they're going to have decreased vitamin d so you have to give them calcium and vitamin d supplementation so you have to give them calcium and vitamin d supplementation now what do you have to do from the respiratory part 
what you have to do from the respiratory part you have to give them parenteral antibiotics especially if they have a respiratory exacerbation especially if they have the respiratory exacerbation what are the organisms what uh, what are the organisms that you can find specifically in cystic fibrosis patients again uh, this is kind of an integration with microbiology so you're going to have burkholderia you can have pseudomonas aeruginosa i told you that there is a special phenotype that is associated with it which is a mucoid phenotype you can have atypical mycobacteria and you can have mrsa you can have mrsa so what is the antibiotic that you have to follow in patients of cystic fibrosis well you have to give them a beta lactam and you have to give them a aminoglycoside and the duration of the therapy must be around 14 days the duration of the therapy must be around 14 days now if there is a end stage pulmonary failure if there is a end stage pulmonary failure in these group of patients what you can do is do a lung transplantation you can go for a lung transplantation and lung transplantation kinds of add around 9 to 10 years of life to these group of patients to these group of patients now, if I'm telling you about lung transplant, just let me tell you most uh, common cause of uh, lung transplant uh, that has been added in new edition of your Harrison is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So most common cause of lung transplant nowadays is IPF, is IPF, right? So this is all about cystic fibrosis, guys. Please read about the genetics, read about the genetics and read about the diagnosis part they are very important from your exam point of view okay